Hi everyone, welcome back. Are you ready to enter the second part of the balance system? Let's go. In this episode, we are first going to take a look at the vestibular reflexes and then explore the pathways to the thalamus, the cortex, and finally take a look at vestibular pathology. Let's start with a question time for reviewing the last part. Please select the correct statements. A. The otolith organs are responsible for sensing rotational acceleration. B. Cranial nerves 3, 4, and 5 are responsible for controlling movements of the eye. C. Projections from the vestibular nuclei form a bundle called the medial lumniscus. D. The labyrinth is filled with endolymph. The only correct answer is D. A is incorrect because the otolith organs are responsible for sensing linear acceleration, while the semicircular canals are actually responsible for rotational acceleration. For B, cranial nerves 3, 4, and 6 are responsible for controlling eye movements. Cranial nerve 5 is not involved. C is incorrect because the bundle is called the medial longitudinal fasciculus instead of the medial lemniscus. We will explore the medial lemniscus in future episodes about somatosensation. sensation. And finally, D is correct. The labyrinth is filled with endolymph, which has low sodium concentration and high potassium concentration. Let's get ahead to the vestibular reflexes. We're going to talk about this particularly interesting reflex called the vestibulo-ocular reflex. It means that the vestibular organs send information to the eyes to coordinate its movements. Let's take a look at this eye. When we turn our head to the right, we cannot look at what we want to look at anymore. As a result, we need the eye not to turn simultaneously with the head. It needs to maintain fixed. And that requires a relative rotation of the eye to our head. When we turn our head to the right, we need our eyeballs to turn to the left. When we turn our head to the left, it's opposite. Therefore, we need the vestibular organs to sense the rotational acceleration and then tell the eye where to rotate. One more characteristic that we need to notice is that when we turn our head to the right, the eyeball goes left. But at some point, the eyeball cannot go left anymore. At that point, the eyeball goes back to the right in a jerking movement. Therefore, head turns right, eyeball turns left slowly, and then goes right quickly. This will be the basis of what we will be talking about. The vestibular ocular reflex, or the VOR, involves these structures. First of all, the semicircular canal, which sends information to the vestibular nucleus, nucleus of cranial nerve 8. Then information goes along the medial longitudinal fasciculus. The ocular motor nucleus for cranial nerve 3 is involved with the control of the medial rectus muscles, the muscles that are right in the middle of the eyes. They let the eye turn inwards. The abducens nucleus, nucleus of the cranial nerve 6, is in charge of the lateral rectus muscle, the muscles that are on the sides of the eye that allows the eyes to turn outwards. We can test whether the vestibular ocular reflex, the eye turning thing, is intact by the caloric test. This is a rather useful clinical practice. First, we need to understand what nystagmus is. Nystagmus is an involuntary, rhythmic, periodic turning of the eye. It usually involves a slow phase to one side and then a jerking phase back to the other side. It usually involves a slow phase moving to one side and a jerking phase back to the other side. The direction that we name the nystagmus is defined by the fast phase. For example, a left beating nystagmus means slowly moving rightwards and then quickly going back leftwards. That we call left beating and vice versa. If we let a person lie down, that is to say with their body supine, and then irrigate one of their external ear canals with cold or warm water, then we will get nystagmus. 
The irrigation here simply means injecting some water from the outer ear into the canal. The nystagmus in a certain direction can be memorized by this. If we irrigate with cold water, then the nystagmus is beating to the opposite side. If we do warm water, then it is to the same side. This mnemonic is called cows, cold opposite, warm same. Why cows? Let's take a look at the exact mechanisms. For example, if we inject cold water into the left ear, here the cold water is some 30 degrees Celsius, which is around 7 degrees Celsius lower than body temperature. Then this cools the endolymph in the semicircular canal closest to the outer ear. This semicircular canal happens to be the canal that controls the movements, the left to right turning of the head. When we are lying down, this canal is in this direction. Since this part of the endolymph is cooled, it falls down, which creates a false sensation of turning our heads towards the right. Then we have a left moving slow phase of the eye. Here's how the neuronal circuits control this movement. The left vestibular nucleus sends information to the right abducens nucleus, which inhibits the lateral rectus muscle of the right eye. This prevents the right eye from turning rightwards. The abducens nucleus also sends information to the ocular motor nucleus on the other side. Then the left ocular motor nucleus inhibits the left eye's medial rectus muscle, which prevents the left eye from turning rightwards. Now, both eyes are prevented from turning rightwards. On the other hand, the right semicircular canals sends information to the left abducens nucleus, which excites the left eye's lateral rectus muscle. This helps turn the left eye leftwards. The abducens nucleus also sends information to the right ocular motor nucleus which excites the medial rectus muscle of the right eye. This turns the right eye leftwards. To sum up, both eyes are prevented from turning rightwards and both eyes are excited to turn leftwards. This creates the left moving slow phase. When the slow phase comes to an end, the right beating nystagmus follows through a similar neural pathway. That is how the caloric test works. We can use this test to examine whether the vestibular organs and the brainstem pathways are functioning normally. Now it's time to review. Please answer the following questions. Why do our eyes slowly move to the right and then beat to the left when we turn our head leftwards? If this is the direction of a nystagmus, please name this. What direction is it beating? Then which year should we irrigate with cold water in order to reach the same effect? And which year should we irrigate with warm water in order to reach the same effect? And please explain why the answer of D works. First question, why do our eyes slowly move to the right and then beat to the left? The first step is the semicircular canals turns counterclockwise. So the endolymph moves clockwise with respect to the semicircular canals. The second step is that the cupula is bent by the endolymph, which activates the hair cells, which in turn transmits information to the vestibular nuclei. And the third step is that the vestibular nuclei activates the ocular motor and abducens nuclei, turning the eyes. This is called a left beating nystagmus because the fast beating phase is to the left. If we want to achieve this through irrigation of cold water, then we should irrigate the right ear because cold opposite. If we inject warm water, then we should inject it into the left ear because warm same. The explanation of the warm water irrigation. First, we irrigate the left ear with warm water. Second, the endolymph in one of the semicircular canals rises because it is heated. Then the false sensation of turning towards the left occurs. Fourthly, we have a right moving slow phase. And five, we have the left beating nystagmus. The thalamus. The information from the vestibular organs is transmitted 
to the ventral posterior inferior nucleus, which is part of the ventral posterior nucleus here. The VP ventral posterior nucleus also includes other nuclei, including the VPL and VPM nuclei. They are a stop by for somatosensory information, that is to say information of touch, pain, itch, and other sensations. Now that we got to the VP nucleus, let's get further upwards. In the cortex, vestibular information is first processed near the primary somatosensory cortex, S1. It is also well characterized in association areas, which are cortical areas that process information from multiple sense modalities. That completes our map of the vestibular system, the system for sensing balance. The last part is the vestibular pathology. Nystagmus, as we've mentioned before, is a pathological, repetitive, rhythmic eye movement. It is involuntary. There are multiple types of nystagmus. We've talked about the jerk type of nystagmus with a fast phase and a slow phase. There is also pendular nystagmus, which is equal velocity type. Vertical. Vertical is the illusion of spinning. It may cause nystagmus and nausea. Motion sickness. Motion sickness means that we feel vertigo because of seeing movement, but not experiencing it. It is the erroneous association between visual and vestibular information. It may cause vertigo, nausea, and sweating. Meniere's disease. Meniere's disease is a disease caused by excessive endolymph. This creates problems both in the cochlea and the labyrinth. It may cause vertigo, which is part of its effects in the semicircular canals, and tinnitus and hearing loss, which is the effects on the cochlea. Tinnitus means that we hear a sound when there isn't actually a sound. The endolymph here oppresses the hair cells in the cochlea, which creates the tinnitus. Vestibular inflammation. This involves inflammation of the vestibular nerve. It causes vertigo, nystagmus, nausea, and possibly loss of balance. Labyrinthitis, the inflammation of the labyrinth, may also cause hearing loss, as well as these symptoms of vertigo, nystagmus, etc. A final recap for the pathology. Please define the following terms and try to list the conditions where they may occur. A. Nystagmus, B. Vertigo, and C. Tinnitus. Please take a few moments and try to list the conditions. For a nystagmus, it is defined as the involuntary repetitive oscillations of the eyes. It may occur in vestibular conditions involving vertigo, motion sickness, Meniere's disease, and vestibular inflammation. It may also be caused in neurological conditions, we have not mentioned this before, but strokes in the brainstem, especially in nuclei related to the vestibular system, may also cause nystagmus. And of course, the caloric test. Vertigo. This is the false sensation of movement, especially spinning. It occurs in vestibular disorders such as motion sickness, Meniere's disease, and vestibular inflammation. It may also be caused by neurological conditions such as strokes in brainstem. And one common form of vertigo happens when we spin ourselves a lot, like this. The inertia of the endolymph in the vestibular organs causes a temporary vertigo. This is not very pathological and recovers in due time. C. Tinnitus. It is the perception of sound in the absence of it. In vestibular disorders, Usually, Meniere's disease may cause tinnitus, because it also affects the cochlea. Other conditions may include middle ear inflammation and other ear-related conditions. And if you have experienced this, loud noise can also cause tinnitus. That is because loud noise activates the outer hair cells, which are sound amplifiers. The outer hair cells respond to this loud noise and begins to activate, vibrate, creating sounds themselves causing more sounds when the sound has actually ended. That concludes this episode. We have seen the vestibular reflexes, the path to the thalamus and the cortex, 
and seen some vestibular pathologies. Thank you for watching this episode. We will get to the chemical senses in the next episodes. See you again.